Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Sorry about that. But luckily, these things reboot fairly fast. And so we're back online. Welcome to an episode of Dartisans, our uh, podcast style, a G plus hangout on air, where we talk about the Dart project and uh, the uh, different uh, elements and releases and news and team members. And today, we're uh, doing a community chat with a lot of the uh, community members who've been working on different projects uh, around the open source community for Dart. So welcome everyone. It's uh, very happy to see everyone. We are broadcasting live. Uh, today in the studio we have Lars Tackman from Denmark who has been releasing a lot of helpful uh, community uh, open source libraries and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about what you've been doing. But let, let's go around. Let's start with uh, on my left, uh, Adam. Introduce yourself. Hey, my name's Adam. I like to hack against Dart and have fun. I'm not working on anything in particular, just kind of absorbing what everyone else is doing and then modifying, playing with, patching, sending back, and just really uh, inspecting everything, that's, inspecting, playing with everything that comes out with Dart. Great. Now, Adam, Great. Adam, don't be so modest because you are the guy who knows about every single patch that ever comes out with Dart, you're the first guy out with it, and that's who we look to to get that great information. Chris, why don't you go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so, again, I'm I'm Chris Chris Bucket, and I've uh, I've done the a couple of libraries, the JSON P library and the JSON Object library. Um, and again, I'm not working on anything particular at the moment other than most of the, most of the offline non-professional work is writing the Dart book, um, Dart in Action, um, which does seem to be taking up an awful lot of my time. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how much the language has, has moved on quite like the last month. It's, um, the, the mailing list seems to have been, go, been going mad with loads of great ideas the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I also uh, run the Dart Watch blog as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say that as well. So, uh, and been posting community updates. I've been trying to keep on top of what's been going on in the community in terms of, um, in terms of libraries that people have been releasing and so on. So I think uh, most of the people here have got libraries up on the Dart Watch blog. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just great to see how much activity there is going on. Cool, and we'll get back to your book uh, a little bit later. John, sure. you're next. Yes, my name is John Evans, and uh, I've been working with Dart, I think now, for about nine months. Really enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's a great platform. It's developed. It's come a long way, certainly, since, since uh, I started working with it. So I've been pleased with, with that. I particularly enjoy the closeness that the community has with the Dart team and the amount of... Uh, I won't say influence, but certainly the amount of, uh, of uh, accordance we're given in, in our ideas and how that in shapes the language. So it's been really a great uh, a great time so far. And uh, you know, the project that I really is, is it really takes up most of my time is the Buckshot UI library. And so um, I continue to work on that, try to put out a good product. Awesome. So we'll chat about Buckshot today, and then uh, sorry, John McCutcheon, the other John. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm John McCutcheon, and uh, I've been working with Dart for, I don't know, three or four months now. Uh, I've released the Dart Vector Math Library, which is a GLSL-like vector math library for uh, Dart. And uh, so I'm mainly interested in uh, kind of the gaming aspect of the Dart language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. And then, Lars, why don't you talk about uh, some of the libraries that you've been working on? Yeah, my name is Lars Tuckman. I'm, I'm doing a startup in Dart, and uh, so I'm basically uh, just developing the libraries that we, that, that are needed to do that. Uh, everything from a small login library to uh, integrating with Amazon Web Services and uh, phone gap inspiration. So um, yeah. So wh where can we find these libraries? Uh, we can find them on GitHub. Okay. I think GitHub, GitHub. Everyone's using GitHub. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Big fan of myself. Yeah. <laughs> I think the phone gap one is the most interesting yeah. uh, to me, at least, because I know a lot of startups and just generally developers want to get their apps across multiple platforms. Yeah. What's the experience been like porting the phone gap that most people are familiar with to something that Dart can use? Well, it's been uh, pretty good. I mean, there's there's some weird things when because we have to integrate with, with JavaScript and have to do callback from JavaScript into uh, into Dart, but but uh, but generally it was. Pretty uh, pretty quick to get running, and 
and there's also a good chance to make like a an API that, that, that fits more with, with the API that that, uh, that Dart has uh, already. So I'm I'm looking a lot into the how Mass and the other guys are creating the, the new um, new APIs and trying to like fit it into that so it gets like this platform feel uh, mm -hmm. rather than just doing a direct port of, of, of how the API is in JavaScript. Oh, good. Okay, so you make it feel darty yeah, in yeah, the process. Yes. Well, you mentioned uh, trying to get data back and forth between Dart and JavaScript. Uh, and I know, so Chris, you, you mentioned really briefly your JSONP library. What, what, was, what was that like, trying to get these two worlds to, to work? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's, um, it, the, the JSON, um, JSON library is, is, is... OK, let me, let me think. The, I understand why there's an issue with the JavaScript and the Dart virtual machines talking with each other, and everything has to go via this message passing thing, which is, which is sort of a, it, it's great because it sort of shares the same model as the isolates. But again, it it can be annoying if you're coming to Dart for the first time and you think, oh, all I want to do is call out to Java JavaScript like we do with Git, and I can't. So, uh, the uh, the, so the way message, you can, uh, so the way to get yeah. Dart and JavaScript to work right now, today at least, is post message. Is what, what absolutely. I mean. so, 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 the, so the post message story is, is great as a as a starting point, um, and uh, I, I know that there is a story that you guys are after to improve the uh, the, the, the post message scenario, I guess. Um, right. In fact, I think I just saw the team mark the issue for uh, better JS interop as. Uh, an M1, which okay. is really, really nice. It's nice to see that, uh, you know, we've heard the feedback and uh, we're going to try to help uh, you migrate slowly, I think, in, into Dart, right? How, how do you get 10% Dart, 20% Dart, 30% Dart, until your whole app is now 100% uh, Dart? And so that, that's great. Yeah, I mean, Hopefully we'll have better I, I, soon. But my, my feeling is that part of, the, part of the issue for JavaScript developers especially, as opposed to Java and C Sharp developers, so JavaScript developers have got their whole heads in the world of JavaScript, and they know their favorite libraries, and they know their favorite UI platforms and so on, and they want to see, how can I take advantage of a bit of Dart, but still make use of some of the stuff that I already know? Exactly. And, um, I think that, that's one of those key use cases. But that, that brings yeah. up a good, a good question for everybody is, uh, you know, we're all developers. We have our experience in C Sharp or, or Java or whatever, and uh, that, I think, colors our expectations or concerns when we approach development web programming and so maybe uh, maybe John McCutcheon can you can you start with the experience you've had in your previous languages and how that's I guess shaped the way you've approached Dart or how you looked at Dart and uh, and so in other words how, how is it like coming from non web programming uh, into web programming in this particular case sure so my background is primarily with C++ uh, programming and uh, what attracted me to Dart uh, over JavaScript was the, the type system. I'm very tied to having a type system and being warned when I'm doing something silly or made a typo or something like that. So that was uh, what first kind of uh, pulled me towards Dart uh, rather than JavaScript. And uh, the language itself is so familiar to someone coming from a C++ uh, background. Even the syntax for uh, generic types, uh, like template types coming from C++. Probably the biggest thing that I've had to get used to is the lack of value types. Uh, I'm used to being able to pass uh, a vector to a function and then modify the vector inside of that function without side effects. Mm -hmm. So that's taken a little bit of getting used to, um, but it's easy to wrap your head around once you understand the object model in Dart. Uh, so John Evans, you uh, have a strong .NET C Sharp background. How has that affected the way you've approached web programming, specifically with Dart? Yeah, for me, it was probably the biggest attractant coming from the .NET. And I was really working a lot in Silverlight at the time and trying to model web UI frameworks in that sandbox. Um, and so stepping in from that sort of class method ar architecture to Dart was was Seamless. It really was seamless. Just getting to know uh, Dart's specific APIs, and then once you pick that up, you're you're off to the races. I think that was uh, the biggest the biggest pull for me, and um, 
Uh, so I really enjoy that that part of the experience. I think that Dart uh, is is probably has its biggest challenge in terms of sell with the JavaScript community uh, because their you know their model with the prototypes is is wholly sort of different from a uh, from a, the way you think about programming standpoint. But for me, yeah, it was an easy easy transition. Well, this might be a good segue into moving from just language into libraries, which is why everyone's uh, here today to chat about their particular projects. Uh, so I know, John, you're working with a, a, a library you call Buckshot. Tell us more about that. And I, I believe it has, uh, uh, it's highly influenced by um, .NET or C Sharp libraries that you're used to. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's actually heavily influenced by the WPF uh, framework. Uh, not to be redundant, but WPF. Uh, and Buckshot, by the way, I, I call it Buckshot because, you know, the definition in Dart parlance means that you're just throwing darts all over the board. Uh, so that, that's really inspired, inspired the name there. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I really enjoyed the experience in Silverlight and WPF of having static templates uh, in XAML and then having a strong data binding model between the template and code where you could, you know, bind events and bind properties uh, and bind, bind uh, primitives, just, you know, literals like integers and strings and so on. So uh, what my experiment with Buckshot was really to try to emulate that model in Dart. And so over the last eight months or so, I think I've gotten to a pretty good place with that. You know, I've got templates and pretty good binding model. I don't have events hooked up yet. Still waiting for Dart's uh, uh, reflection to come in for that. But uh, yeah, by and large, it's been a pretty good experiment. I think it's I think it shows the power of Dart because this is certainly a non-trivial project that I'm working on. Uh, it's exercised language pretty much in every corner, at least on the client side, that uh, that I can push it, and and it's done pretty well. So uh, I've been very pleased with that experience so far. How can people try out Bookshop? Yeah, you can just go to uh, the the project on on GitHub. Uh, give it a download. There's plenty of documentation. I got a bunch of videos I've done that walk you through different uh, different uh, approaches to how to set up programs with it, uh, and just give it a try. Give me some feedback. I will say, as just a caveat, that it, it currently only works with Dartium and and the latest builds of Chromium, and that's because I'm using the latest HTML5 CSS3 APIs, the very latest, to make some of those layouts happen. So. Um, just put that one caveat, but aside from that, give it a try. I'd love to hear some feedback. Well, Dart is certainly looking at helping uh, developers from all different platforms, uh, non-endemic web developers, that is, uh, to be successful and develop really high-performance, full-featured apps. And I think that implies a, uh, a strong, uh, easy-to-use, client-side MVC-type framework. And that's where I think Buckshot fits in. So, uh, Adam, I, I need to ask, you, you've been around for, in the Dart community for quite a while, and you always seem to be able to pick out all those commits almost right when they happen. Yeah. And, uh, tell, tell me, how, you, how do you do that? Late nights. <laughs> <laughs> how do, I, uh, I, I signed up, I get the emails from uh, the issue tracker, and I, I just kind of scan through just the, the commit title, and, and usually there's enough description to find out if there's something interesting in that commit. And, a lot of the hot things like finding out when mirrors are going to come or what the mirror API is going to look like or what the changes or isolates are coming, they, they kind of just pop out in those uh, commit uh, logs. So I, once I see them, I like to share them with everyone else because that, you know, going through the amounts of commits that go into to Dart is so much, it's it's really hard to, you know, for everyone in the community to, to keep up with it. So I pull them out and I post them on G Plus because I, I feel like it general community kind of wants to see some of those. Even though they're all really good commits, you just can't go through all of them. Yeah, well, we definitely appreciate the service. Yeah. Uh, there, you're right, there is a tremendous amount of commits, and, and for those who don't know, Dart is uh, an open source project, and so you can follow along uh, in our master subversion repository, and then we have mirrors over into GitHub there as well. And so uh, if reading commits all day is your thing, follow Adam on uh, G+. And, uh, yeah, he does seem to pick out the gems around uh, the new interesting things like mirrors for reflection and isolates. This is all good stuff, and I know a lot of us are waiting with bated breath for these things to land. Uh, so, yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Adam. 
while, uh, while, we're, while we're chatting with you, uh, so you participate in the Mountain View Dart Hackathon, and yeah. uh, you built a Redis uh, database driver and kind of a front end. Tell, tell us a little bit about what you built and what did you learn? Yeah, it was, it was really fun. We took, we were a team of five people, and I was kind of helping lead the team because I had the experience with Dart. The other developers came from backgrounds of Java, JavaScript, um, I think Python, and they really just picked up Dart right away. So in this project, it was to do an implementation of a front end and back end in uh, Dart using Redis as your key value store, and then using some nice features of HTML5 and CSS as your front end. So the front end would run Dart, and it would do this like virtual like Linux terminal. And you would send commands in the terminal, but it's, it's really just a web browser with the text input, some really nice CSS. And do a, an XHR request out to a Dart server that runs you know, uh, on localhost through the Dart VM, and then take those and then proxy the commands to the Redis service, which the Redis service ran over uh, a raw socket, well, you know, a TCP socket with its own uh, uh, type of, of binary format, a very simple binary format, but uh, uh, easy to use. So it was, it was nice to see that you're playing with raw sockets on the server side, dealing with binary communications between a different service that's run, written in native code or written in something, and then prox and then sending all that information back up through the web, the Dart web server into the, the Dart web client. So it was kind of nice way to see information pass from a user all the way down to a system. And that, that's such an excellent point that uh, at first it wasn't very clear. I mean, we were talking about Dart as a language targeting web apps, but Dart does ship with a virtual machine that you can run right on the command line, right on the server. And so it's enabled a suite of Dart apps now running on the server. You have Dart running on the client. And I know that for your, your project, you're running uh, both Dart on the client and the server. Is that right? What, uh, what are some of the things you had to build open source library-wise to, to make that happen? Uh, Basically, the Amazon integration layer was not completely done yet. We are waiting for a few things to happen in the Dart VM, but, but, but that, was, uh, that was our main thing, because we're using Amazon DynamoDB and uh, S3 and uh, SQL, SQS, the, the queue service. So, so, so basically, we just uh, we had to, to get some crypto support into the VM, uh, which uh, landed really, really quickly. I think it was like a week after. So, so that was really cool that we got that. And um, yeah, that, 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 that's, uh, that's that's what we're using for on the server side. We're using it. Uh, we're going to use it more as soon as HTTPS lands in the in the VM. Yeah, I think as as Dart matures, you're going to see a lot more end-to-end -end solution set because that story of having the same language on client server is really, really strong. But I, I don't think that's really come to the fore yet because there isn't that whole tie through, you know, that's that's clean. But Wow, it's going to be great when you have that, right? Instead of having to have three different tools, you can just work in one code base and make it happen from stem to stern. I'm looking forward to it. Well, that's definitely part of the vision. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of the use cases we, we kick around here is can we use the isolates abstraction as the way to communicate between client and server, much like you can use the isolate abstraction to communicate between portion, like intra-application communications. Can you do inter-application communication? I think not only can you use the same language in, in two different worlds, server and client, can you use the same abstractions uh, between client-client and client-server? So yeah, yeah, I hope more of that. I've heard Gilad talk about that a couple of times on his videos, and that's a really cool thing. If we can make that happen with isolates, that's going to be great. Yeah, well, I think the semantics basically work uh, in posting messages, waiting for returns on ports. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that always kind of comes up in my mind is I, I think to really achieve this vision of uh, a more unified environment client-server, I think we need to do better at unifying our libraries across client and server. I know that uh, John McCutcheon is something that I think you've been recently thinking about in terms of the, the byte arrays. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the work you've done in the Dart Vector Math Library and uh, anything in terms of uh, using those byte arrays across client and or server or both? Sure. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about using them in the client and the server. There, the issue right now is that there are two different types. Uh, one is float32list, and that's available on the server, and the other is float32array, and that comes from Dart HTML. The semantics of both of these are practically identical. So uh, 
it's a little bit tricky to ship a library right now where you're using float32 arrays or float32 lists because there are all, there, there's like a fence dividing these two worlds. So anything that can be done to bring them together and um, have a common subset that works on both the server and the browser would be very beneficial. Uh, speaking to uh, what I've been doing with float32 arrays with dark vector math, uh, last weekend I started doing some benchmarking of dark vector math and comparing it with a port of glmatrix.js to the dark language. And I noticed immediately that there was a huge performance advantage towards dark vector math, but it didn't actually make that much sense when you start to look into the code because it's a 4x4 four four matrix multiplication operation. The code is the same everywhere. There's, there's not a lot of variation here. Um, and looking at the disassembly, you can see that the VM right now does an inline accesses to float32 array uh, elements. Uh, I've heard back from some of the VM engineers that it will in the near future, so that's great. Um, but there's, a, there's another benefit to using float32 arrays versus native Dart objects, and that's what WebGL expects uniform values to be passed into it is as a float32 array and not a native Dart object. I think it's important to reiterate that it's very early days for the whole project. It's still in technology preview, uh, which means we're changing stuff a lot. I mean, as we were talking earlier with Adam, uh, keeping up with everything. And performance is definitely one of those areas where we know we have uh, particular areas in mind that we're going to visit. Uh, we know that there's um, further research to do there. And so the kind of uh, early um, work that, that you're doing, John, really helps us uh, get to where we want to get, but yeah, it's uh, we definitely have work to to go to improve it. Uh, of course, it's it's very very early. Um, but following on to this work, I also started uh, work on a SIMD operations library uh, embedded into the VM. So this takes the float32 arrays and uses the SIMD instruction sets available in the CPU. In the code that I posted, it's SSE, but it could work on other platforms as well. And this is very fast and works very nicely with the Float32 array abstraction available in Dart. Cool. And we, we did see that patch, and that's awesome. It was really cool. It sparked a lot of discussions here, and uh, uh, certainly there's a lot of work to go there, but uh, we hope that the discussions continue with, with features like that, which kind of move us above and beyond what's available in web programming today. Uh, so thanks for kicking that off. It's a lot of fun. Chris, I'd like to hear more about the book that you're writing. I mean, how Dart is so so young and, and, and changing all the time. How, how are you compensating with that? Yeah, um, so what I'm sort of trying to do with the book is, although it's going through and it's teaching Dart as core concepts, so you've got the classes, you've got types, you've got things that um, people who are coming from C Sharp or Java will be comfortable with, but then you've also got things that people coming from JavaScript might not be comfortable with, I mean, you've got the uh, vice versa as well, the dynamic typing that Java, that Java and C-sharp developers won't necessarily be so comfortable with, but JavaScript developers will be comfortable with. And so it's sort of bringing those two worlds together in the form of Dart. So although Dart is changing and it's, it's evolving over, uh, has evolved over the last sort of few months, it's, the core concepts are all still the same um, in terms of the optional typing, the class system, the interfaces, so on and so forth. And so in terms of um, keep it, keeping the book current while Dart is changing is proving it, it's not easy, but it's, uh, it, it, uh, I, th I think that I'm, I'm sort of splitting it up nicely. So we've got a client, a client part of the book, a server part of the book, the core components in terms of classes and type systems, and it, it fully advocates sort of the, the single page application type architecture. Which um, which a Dart's main use case really is, I think. Um, it, it's, it's designed for building proper web applications as opposed to interactive websites. Um, although there's nothing to stop you using it for interactive websites, it's um, it, it's, it's a great platform, almost like the next step from GWT Grit onwards to produce proper line of business applications, games, um, and anything in between. Well. You mentioned optional typing as one of those uh, new kind of core concepts to the language, and I'd love to hear actually from the panel about 
how you were able to approach optional typing. Is it something that clicked right away? Is it something that took a little while to kind of feel around? Uh, John Evans, let's let's just start with you. It didn't click right away to me, but you know, I the good thing was there was a couple of good you know videos out there, and certainly the, the mailing list really helps for that for that type of stuff. Um, coming from you know f a strongly statically typed language like C sh like the .NET family. Uh, yeah, I didn't understand the the decoupling there at first, but once you once you understand that 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 types are really just annotations in Dart, everything at the runtime is is a uh, is uh, not semantically tied to that. Uh, then it's then then you're okay with it. Then you use it as a tool in development cycle, right? And so I use it to help me uh, check my mistakes, as John was talking about earlier, while I'm developing. But when I feel comfortable with the code and I have a unit tests behind that to back it up. You can back all that out and just keep your local methods and, and operations very clean and very succinct uh, by by uh, not using types. There. So yeah, I, I think that a uh, little a little learning cycle, but once you get once you get through that, and certainly there's plenty of good information out there of, of what optional typing is and so on. So uh, um, uh, now I use it and I'm very comfortable with it. I guess the question is, and I'll start start with you, Lars. Is what, what's the benefit of optional static types? Like, do you, now that you've gotten your head wrapped around it, uh, yeah. do do you like it, and does it buy you anything? Yeah, I really liked it, it, but I'm also having done a a, a bit of C sharp programming. I, I it really just reminds me of how how var variables I, I used in C sharp, uh, yeah. but but in a, in a more loose manner. So so I was um, I, I think I caught up with it fairly quickly and. Mostly in the start, I also just added the type information to get tab completion and to to catch errors. But I think uh, today the, the the editor has become so good that that it that it, it actually catches uh, most of those errors anyway. So and in particular, if you want in check mode, then then you then most of the time you can just uh, move the type at least and, and yeah uh, for, for for the variables you assign immediately. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and, and maybe John McCutcheon or or Adam um, and. If you remove those types and you use var, what's the advantage to you guys, or do you even do that? I do. You know, when I'm doing samples, I only pretty much use the types for the, the ID and the tools to really tell me what's going on. And I, I kind of jumped in it with, without using, without having my prior background influence the way I was doing things. I'm like, I'm just going to do things the way they say, use types, don't use types, see how it, you know, it, it works out. And I found... A lot of times when I just want to code through something really fast and I just want to get something running right away, I don't have to worry about types, I don't have to be concerned. And then I can go back and do unit tests or testing or even add types later as I need them. Or if it's something public facing, you know, it makes a lot of sense to have types to just show off what it does, but it doesn't, doesn't really interfere in the internal code. Um, and, I, you know, I, I just kind of uh, said, let me go with it and see what happens. And I think with that approach, I didn't feel like I got burned in any way or, or I didn't have any kind of, I guess, religiosity against types or not having types. I just went with the flow and I, I, I really like it. I, it kind of just makes sense if that's possible. Adam, I think you really uh, hit the nail on the head there. I, I really like types uh, for public interfaces. That's, to me, I think one of the, the biggest wins that you get with Dart is that you can really advertise strictly what your library's API is going to accept. Um, and and you also hit it on the head when you said that you can ignore types and go really quickly. I like that when I'm just playing around, it doesn't matter, I can just throw a bar everywhere. And then once I'm kind of satisfied with the code and I want to really uh, clean it up uh, so that it's consumable by other parts of my uh, application or library, that's when I start to really annotate with types. But at the public API, uh, having types there is, is excellent. One of the I really, really appreciate that when I'm trying to port uh, or work with old JavaScript code that I've written a long time ago, and I'm, I'm usually in reading the method to figure out just what the heck I was doing, and uh, just having the types uh, is such a fantastic um, benefit and productivity and really maintenance. And I, I think that that's the real test of uh, a platform or language is most languages you can kind of get dirty, get something running without, you know, really know what you're doing, and you get some results. but how quick is that transition to maintenance, uh, and what's the experience like when you're in maintenance mode? 
to me kind of separates the languages into fun toy or something I can actually do something with. Uh, and the the tools of Dart, like the editor and these refactoring abilities, and then the type annotations, at least for me, mean that when I'm in that maintenance mode, it's actually a decent experience, and, and it's something like I'm not afraid of going back to that code. So that 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 I'm I'm really happy with. Yeah, I would second that, Seth. You know, my buckshot is over 25,000 lines now, and so when I go back into something, I'm writing something new, something that I wrote, you know, six months ago. Now I get now I get warnings in the in the editor if I've forgotten my old API even. So that that's a big help on the maintenance cycle. You're right. Yeah, but definitely also I, I've been developing large scale uh, client side web apps for a number of years now, and and when you when you do a web app in JavaScript, it, 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 I mean you could definitely do that, but but it starts getting a pain when you go above like twenty thousand lines of code or something like that. It's hard to refactor it, and and with that I have like uh, also a lot of code, and, and we are constantly moving it around. Uh, I don't mind doing that at all, and it, it, uh, then you get a couple of errors and you fix it, and you are back. I mean. So, so that's the huge advantage. Uh, so that's why I'm sprinkling types all over. Yeah. To get that. Cool. Well, that's definitely the vision. <laughs> Glad to hear it's working. So here's the portion of the show where I, I want to hear some feedback from each one of you. Uh, if what is one or two things that you'd like the Dart team to know? Uh, what are some requests from you? Because you know. Here's some of our most pro prolific uh, developers out there. We can check out your GitHub. Uh, so that's, it's definitely obvious you're active on the mailing list. But I think you know uh, very well what it is you need to kind of go to even that next level. So maybe we'll, we'll start with, with Adam here and we'll work around. But uh, is, is there anything that you'd like to see next? Uh, maybe a suggestion to re-bump in the priority list? Yeah. Next, I don't know, but uh, there's one thing long term that I think is, is very valuable, and I think Microsoft has really, really hit it on the, the head with, with, with giving SDK samples, like you know, thousands of samples. If you go into the SDK developer kit, they got samples for everything, and I, I feel that's something that really helps sell a platform and a language when a you know a, an enterprise engineer can come and just take stuff right out of the box and say, okay, this is what I need, or this is kind of the direction I go, or what's the proper way. I know it's a long-term thing, but it's just something I, 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 I really hope that the dark team takes into consideration. And yeah, that's that. a great suggestion. Um, I think that will come in time, and I totally hear you. We have some, in fact, uh, Devin from the editor team just cleaned up uh, the stock samples that come with the editor, and there's a couple of samples that aren't readily faced in the editor. Uh, so I think it's more on our radar now, and I think over time as things settle down, I think there's still some library work uh, to do, and then we can kind of go full force on that. But I, I, I agree. I think mo most developers want the cut and paste cookbook style thing, uh, and so yeah, great idea. Immediately though, I think mirrors is, is, is on the mind of a lot of people, and that, that might provide the ability for people to do even more innovative stuff with regard and more kind of you know out of the box stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Check. Plus one for mirrors. Chris. Yep. Plus one for mirrors. Uh, that's the top of my list. Um, <laughs> but so, seriously, after that, um, what I'd really like to see, and I think this is a not necessarily a blocker for people you, like us using it, but I think it might be. It's a blocker at the moment for people using it for proper commercially supported applications. Is the language is still fairly moving around quite a lot, and I think that. Although it's it's good to have people building stuff with it early on while the language is moving because it means you guys get great feedback. It also means that some people are, are wary of taking on a language that's so new and still moving around because it means that code they write today might not work in six months' time. Um, and there's, there's, there's no real easy answer to that. Sorry, go on. Go ahead, John. I was just saying, get it done faster, man. That's That's what he's saying. <laughs> Uh, well, I think, like, like Seth was saying about going into maintenance mode, yeah. uh, we've we've got software that we're supporting five, that we wrote five years ago, and the, the customer is still asking for changes on it. And at the moment, I couldn't say yes. We'll go and write our next big project in Dart with it as it is today. But I know that in six months' time or a year's time, we'd definitely say yeah, go and write it in Dart. Yeah. And for, for me, well, this, the, it can't come soon enough. But obviously, you guys need the, that sort of process to go through to get the feedback from us guys picking up early on and building with it. 
Yeah, and, and I know that uh, getting to some sort of milestone for the language, at least so that the implementations can catch up and the books don't have to be changed every week. And, uh, you know, uh, once you have a language uh, M M1 event horizon, if you will, then with those assumptions, I think you can move on to second and third order type problems in the system. Yeah. And uh, so uh, you can go into the issue tracker for, for everyone at home. You can go into the issue tracker and uh, filter on, uh, I think, milestone M1. And it'll give you a sense of what made that cut. Now, I don't really know exactly what M1 uh, means, but I believe it's a, a line in the sand for things we're going to attack sooner versus things we're going to attack later. Uh, but it, yeah, at least that, that, that idea of what, what's in M1 is forming. And so you can kind of follow along at, at home with that. So uh, yeah, um, I think we do uh, appreciate, though, having this kind of rare, possibly only opportunity to uh, make bre backwards breaking changes. Uh, yeah. So that's just part of the process. And, and you see it all because it's open okay. source, so it feels probably it's, extra painful. But. It's, it's really good comparing this to, say, sort of C Sharp or what other languages that have been developed because Dart has been released to the community so early on that people have actually been able to get hands on and get dirty with it even while making changes are going, up, going on in that. And it's, it's, it's great that Google have done this. It's, 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 it's actually very fun. I enjoy it. I think it's very exciting. Mm. Yeah, me too. Cool. Appreciate that. John, John, what do you, what do you need us to do? Plus one for, uh, for uh, mirrors. Okay. Uh, so I think that, you know, in order for me to build a, a truly all, you know, sort of comprehensive web application, I'm really looking forward to that integration to the, uh, to the Google API ecosystem. Yeah. You know, that, that, I got to get OAuth, right? I got to get G plus, and be able to hook into those identities so you can bring that into your application. Um, otherwise, you're stuck with really wonky workarounds right now. So I think that one is probably getting will will the pressure for that will be start to build as Dart moves towards M1. I think because people need that in order to build, you know, a, a fully uh, fully encompassed application. I think the second thing that you know for me, particularly working in Buckshot. I'm, I'm obviously working in Dart HTML a lot, and I've seen that API mature very well over the last, uh, last um, almost year now. And uh, I'd like to see, obviously, more out of that. I mean, more standardization, more normalization across browsers uh, is going to be very important. And I know that's a big challenge, because there's a lot of nuance between browser standards, at, even at the very property level. But if Dart can, if Dart can make that happen and make you know, building a web application easier from a cross-browser story standpoint, it's really going to be a win because that'll draw people right away. A lot of the JavaScript stuff now really is, that's, those libraries do that for JavaScript developers, and if Dart has that batteries included, it's going to be a really great story. So I'm excited about that. I think, I think the team, the team is going to agree with you on that. Uh, I think it's a very real problem that web developers face today is how do you deal with vendor prefix differences, how do you deal with implementation differences, how do you deal with APIs that may not even exist? And you know, sometimes we may not be able to do anything about it. But I think in the, many of the cases, and as the polyfill kind of culture of JavaScript has shown us, there are a lot of cases where you can uh, write to a standards-compliant API shim and uh, help help cover over, spackle over some of those differences. Right. Uh, and yeah, so that's a real problem. So why shouldn't why shouldn't Dart help you solve that? So yeah, great feedback. John McCutcheon. All right. Um, I've been taking some notes. Uh, so uh, unified binary data support and some more, um, not more, but different uh, abstractions around binary data. Right now we have arrays of, of typed data, but you know you might want to have a ring buffer or uh, some, some other types of containers for storing uh, binary data. Uh, Cindy operations on float32 arrays. And then something that's uh, maybe up for discussion is I'm starting to turn my attention towards isolates and hiding libraries that I'm writing behind isolates. And I have two main concerns, and uh, I may just be wrong about this, but I think I read somewhere on the mailing list that there won't be support for passing an arbitrary Dart object instance through in one isolate to another. And I really hope that that does happen. I hope that I can construct any, any Dart object that I can construct can be sent over to another isolate. Uh, 
that would make me feel a lot more comfortable with isolates. Mm -hmm. And then passing ownership of objects from one isolate to another efficiently if they're on the same machine uh, would be awesome. Right. Now, that's, I think you're alluding to the transferable typed arrays that uh, the WebGL spec has helped introduce. Uh, so uh, I, I should probably say that the isolates library uh, is one of the um, less less refactored libraries in the system. I think that it's uh, it's integral to the Dart story, and uh, there's a lot of potential there. And uh, I think we're trying to get some of the more core things working before we reattack isolates. So I, ex I expect some uh, some more focus on isolates. Uh, in the future, and so this is good feedback for us. But yeah, I, I don't think what you see with isolates today is is our final vision by by any means. Um, so may, maybe I can ask a follow up for you. And, and what what is so a use case or two that is dictating some of these isolate based requests? So I'm working right now on a graphics library that I want to run uh, as a separate thread, essentially. Uh, I want all of the uh, object culling to be done away from my main application. Uh, so basically that means that I need my game logic to communicate back to the rendering engine, which is running in whatever the isolate happens to be running under. Uh, and I don't want to be limited by uh, w how complex of a, a message I can send between the two. And uh, I want to maximize pro my performance, uh, maybe generating a vertex buffer and I want to pass that over to the rendering engine, and I want to do that as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Good use cases. Uh, we'll finish up with Lars here, who has may maybe written the most dark code uh, I've seen outside of Google, possibly even within, within also including Google. Uh, what, are, what is something that you'd like us to add to help you be more productive? Um, what I really miss is, uh, I don't know if it's an actual language feature, but, but I really miss some, uh, some middleware. In order to, uh, I mean, not servlets, but but you know, a more modern version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of a uh, lot of uh, tiny web frameworks out there that, that that could be turned into that. But I feel that that in order to to really move on with with the server side of uh, uh, server side of that and to you know write all that stuff OAuth integration, we need some kind of, of uh, I don't know, it should be standardized, but it should definitely be like a connect. Uh, from, from the node world and that. I, I really need that. Um, and then in order to just move that forward, we need to have a uh, cup being more used. Yes. Uh, I really like uh, on, on the C Sharp world, they made this, um, I think, called New, New Jet. This is like uh, this uh, package man with really nice integration into Visual Studio and you can see what, what it's like, what's the test framework everybody's using. And, 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 and that is just a, a really neat way for people who are not. Uh, just thinking around like Adam in, in, in every patch and uh, every GitHub commit to, to like see what, what what is going on. I think that that is going to be uh, going to be needed. Uh, I'm also of course going to get a plus well, probably a hundred to uh, to mirrors or something like that, mm -hmm. and then maybe a weight support like like in C sharp so it can hide the fact that you are using an isolate in some asynchronous API. Yeah. Well, I think the good news is the the mirror stuff sounds like it's a resounding plus 100 plus 4. Uh, yeah, so there's active work on the mirrors going on. So, uh, yeah, it, the mirrors is a little tricky because we want to make sure we don't, or we can still enable intelligent tree shaking and uh, small amount of code over the wire even um, if you have reflection going on. So we've got to get that API correct, uh, but there's active work there. And so that, that's good news. So good, good to hear that um, unanimous feedback on that. Um, and we should probably mention Pub, as, as you did, uh, the, the package manager for Dart. Uh, that's in the SDK today. It has basic support for Git-based uh, repositories. And uh, we have you know, nice high hopes for this system. Uh, we think it will open the floodgates to third-party developers, much like yourselves, but others. Uh, standardize around the, the, uh, the package format, like what do some of the directories look like. I know Kevin Moore on the list has done some work to try to plant some seeds on what, what a Dart package might look like. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm personally very much looking forward to that. And uh, you'll be able to do a pub install, and it just pulls down all the dependencies. And uh, you as author libraries will be able to uh, put your packages up for pub to consume. So that, that, that's cool, and I, I, uh, that's already well underway. So good, good so on cool that. So potentially planning to be like maybe a central authority for some packages, or at least a 
you know, one central authority for packages from third parties? Yeah, part of the scope of the pub project is not only the uh, command line tools to help you install and manage those third party dependencies, but also provide a hosting service for packages and their metadata uh, to ease and enable discovery of packages. You should be able to do something like pub search XML and find John's XML library, for instance. Um, so yeah, certainly we won't be the only one, and uh, hopefully the community takes these ideas and goes even further with them, but yes, we'll, we'll help seed, seed the, the third-party package repository with, with something running uh, and plugged into the Dart tool, um, sorry, the pub tool by default. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, I, I'm going to wrap up with, with a shout-out to each one of your projects again because you've done some, so much good work for and with the Dart community. We highly, highly appreciate it. Uh, so if you want to follow along with all the news and find Adam Smith on uh, GitHub, man, and follow him. He, he will get you plugged in to the late-breaking patches, uh, sometimes uh, quicker than the editor can uh, do a build. <laughs> so that's awesome. Uh, and Chris Bucket, thank you very much, joining us from the UK there, and good luck with your book. I believe it's getting published by Manning. That's right, yep. It's, okay. um, ten chapters written, five more to go. And do you have an expected publishing? Like, when should we approximately find the book? Um, it should be in paper, January, February next year. It's available now as a early access. Ah, so people can check out your book right now? Yeah, Manning.com. All right, good. And John, awesome work on the recent screencast you've been doing on, on Buckshot and, and the XML library. I know uh, uh, modern web developers like to talk in JSON, but there's a whole ton of stuff out there with XML, so uh, yeah. happy to see that come out of the community, so I appreciate that. And, and the website again for Buckshot is what? It's on GitHub, GitHub slash Prujohn slash Buckshot. Okay, P-R-U-J-O-H-N. P-R-U-J-O-H-N. Awesome, and you can, uh, there's even a try buckshot. You can do it right in your browser, and you can watch a screencast. Yes, it's all there on the uh, GitHub homepage. Cool. It's good to see those MVC frameworks uh, start to come out. And John McCutcheon, thank you so much for the awesome uh, low-level work in the VM and the SIMD uh, patches that kind of plant those seeds as well. And uh, I, I hear hints of another library you're working on, and so I'm excited to see what that's going to turn into. Me too. And uh, you can get Dark Vector Math at my GitHub. And your GitHub is? Just John McCutcheon. Ah, oh, perfect. Yes, mine is Seth Lad. I find that much easier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah, this is going to go uh, up on YouTube. We'll share it out again. And the Dart team is absolutely listening to your feedback, and so we really appreciate it. And uh, so thanks for working so early with this brand new web programming language, and we hope Sounds like you're having fun, and uh, we hope to continue to keep you guys productive and happy. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We're signing out. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you next episode of Dartisans. Bye. 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 Bye.